They have been around our community for several decades now and they're quite the authority on the subject you'll see on the screen. I'm looking forward to their presentation more than anything I can say right now, so I hope you enjoy it. I'll turn the floor over to you. We'd also like to thank you for taking your time to listen to our story. It's a little different than probably some of the things you've heard. Some of it may seem simple, some of it may seem bizarre, but it's our story and we'll tell it like it is. So um, let's see, we have a brief video that'll zero you in on where we're at and where we've been up to the present and then we'll take it from there of where <clears throat> what we're doing now and where we're going in the future. So whenever they're ready with the video, I think it's coming up now. This is, I lived in Las Vegas. This is arriving from the, uh, a, sh a shoot for the Discovery Channel, which is a, a, a hello. very- Hello. Well, hello. How, you doing? How are you? Dominique. I'm doing fine, welcome. Thank welcome you. To, welcome to Las Vegas. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for coming. Come on in. Yeah, sure. Welcome to our home. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for taking some time. It's really interesting to talk to you about these flying saucers that well. you have not only been <laughs> building, but flying from what we hear. Yes. Uh, well, uh, we started, uh, at least I started, back uh, in uh, the late 50s and early 60s. We've rebuilt, redesigned them for years after that. We want to uh, now turn them into a, a form of habitation and transportation for people so that they, their home will be their transportation as well. Ralph, by, by we, who do you mean exactly? Oh, okay. Well, I should fill you in on that, I guess. Nikola Tesla was a great inventor and uh, a great, great humanitarian. Well, Tesla wanted to get into his field, which was free, if you will, energy that comes from the surroundings. He was hired by um, J.P. Morgan to work with S, uh, Westinghouse and Edison companies and, and on the East Coast. And Tesla said, I've, I've got it made. I think we can now transmit electrical power through the earth, through the ionosphere, without any wires or, or telephone poles. If you gave a device, like a free energy device, a generator that would, would uh, service all their needs in their home for free, they could then bring out their creative talents, which they were born with and had been suppressed because they've had to toil for a living. They could be tremendous artists beyond, beyond our dreams, tremendous engineers beyond our dreams. J.P. Morgan was not buying it. He said, no, we're gonna have to tear this stuff down. So Tesla kind of pulled back into himself and decided, you know, well, I guess it's not time for this. And, well, at, at that time he was living in the New Yorker Hotel, actually, in New York. And um, there was a fellow by the name of Otis Carr who he's going to school and to supplement his, his income, he worked as a clerk in this hotel. And uh, Tesla and him became acquainted. And Carr was a sponge. He loved science in every way, shape, or form. But he was a natural science. He believed in the same thing Tesla did, that there, there's no limits to natural science and everything should be on a simple level. Tesla said, they're, they're not interested in my, my time. I want you to take everything I can teach you and go in your time and see if they'll listen to you. And if you don't make it, you're gonna have to pass it on because at the rate we're going, we're on a self-destructive course. Carr said, I will, I will. And he's, he got his own lab started and, and started uh, uh, really getting into a lot of free energy devices and building them. So he built a spaceship? Mm -hmm. He's building small spaceships in, and uh, he had different sizes, different models. So tell us how you met Otis Carr and how you began working with these flying saucers. There's a company, Advanced Kinetics, in Costa Mesa. That's where we were living, in Costa Mesa, California. And they're looking for a research and development laboratory technician. They gave me a job, they put me in the research lab, and I was inventing ideas all day long. I just loved it because I, I like to invent simple ways of doing hard things. And was, and was Otis Carr working there too? No. I told some friends about, about, about this and what I was doing and he said, well, come to our group. We've got a group here called Understanding. It was created by a, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Fry in California. We could talk about things that were unlimited, not limited. I said, my mission is to see that we have habitation and transportation in, in one vehicle. And he said, well, you, you sound like a guy that's back east getting in trouble right now. His name is Otis Carr. 
and he put in a patent for a levitation device and they, they wouldn't give him the patent. They had to, he said, you've got to pull that levitation out and anchor it on the ground and we'll give you a patent on an amusement device. You cannot use levitation. They brought him out to California. They said, here's your lab. They, it was all built, it had living quarters, it had uh, you know, machine shops, it had... And that's where you did most of your work, I imagine. And this is where you guys worked on the spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to develop this craft? Day and night, 24-7, we were building these small prototypes. And they would range anywhere from uh, 12 inches to three feet to six feet, to, you know, in, in size. And they actually flew, they actually levitated. Oh, yeah. Oh, and what sure. was the source of the power? Well, it was magnetic in nature. And, uh, and you were actually easier. building these for people to sit in. I mean, not just models. These were, these were prototypes just to prove uh, what we wanted and then graduate up to where human habitation could, could get on board and, and, and operate them. If you could explain to us very simply how this device, how these craft work. In those days, yeah. we had counter-rotating wheels, one going clockwise and another going counterclockwise. We had a capacitor, we had small magnets, and um, we had what's called a utron. It was a double tetrahedron. That's two ice cream cones put with the open ends together. But you have a diamond shape. And we had 12 of them around the periphery of the craft. And we had magnets, horseshoe magnets, 12 of those around the craft. So when you started rotating and counter-rotating, the, as these utrons went through the field, they would act as, as a generator and a capacitor in, in themselves, and they would generate a lot of power, not necessary electrical power, but vibrational power. When you get to the resonant frequency of your surroundings, uh, it cancels everything out. It goes to a zero point. And once you've reached zero point, then you can go anywhere you want. And you're, you're, you have your own force field around the, the craft. Just a brief pause. This is a, for a commercial venture, so they put a commercial in this slot, and that's the original tape. So just be 10 seconds. You control its up and down and left and right movements by how fast it spins or other gyros in there? Yeah, the ones with the models we had, we had uh, remotes, you know, to, to, to operate the models. But <clears throat> when, when you get up into the larger craft, it's not necessary because everything then, as Carr was explaining, the difference between the brain and the mind is synergetic. You operate the craft like it was a friend. It's, it's like it was a living thing. So because you connect with the craft. Yes. And, and that's, that's the only way that our particular craft would work. There was a mental interface? Yes. So it's wow. kind of like yes. the thoughts carry out a vibration as well, mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. go in harmony with the ship. So wow. some sort of morphogenic field was created, perhaps, some sort of almost yes. living field. Yeah, absolutely. Ralph, have you had a chance to fly it yourself? Flying is an, an antiquated word when it comes to the type of spaceships that we were operating because they don't f conventionally fly. More they, levitate. They levitate and they teleport. They move through this thing called time and space. They actually traverse through multi-dimensions. So you created an artificial gravity field, is it safe to say? Uh, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Is this in any way related to the work of John Hutchinson and his anti-gravity experiments? Well, it's along the same lines. I know John, he's, he's an associate of our group. And as I mentioned before, there's all forms of levitation. But where ours differs from John's is that in order to operate our craft, it takes spirit, it takes, it takes a synergy. It, you have to recognize the craft as an entity of, of, of life itself. It has a consciousness, if you will, of its own. What John is doing, is wonderful. I'm glad he's discovered a tremendous field of uh, levitation and, and uh, composition of, of metal and uh, manicular structures. Ralph, can you tell us about your experience as being the co-pilot of one of these discs? Sure. The next stage up was the 45-foot craft. It was, uh, they had already designed and built it, and uh, <clears throat> they wanted us to test it. So we got on board, and near the center of the craft was a, a giant crystal ball in a kind of a gyroscopic holder. Underneath that was a laser that came up through the bottom of this crystal. And 
As the light came up and dispersed around this crystal, it lit up the crystal from infrared all the way, way around to ultraviolet. Then then Carr said, okay guys, <clears throat> what I want you to do is just clear your brain and use your mind. So this is an experiment and we're going to go outside and back in through what's known as time and space. And all you have to do is concentrate on what I'm, what I'm about to tell you. We're going to go down range 10 miles. And that 10 miles down range is equated to the vibratory rate of the color aquamarine. The colors just kind of dissolved and started turning into this brilliant aquamarine. And it lit up the whole ship. And then he said, okay, that's it, boys. Get out of the craft and we're going to debriefing. And we looked at each other like, oh, I don't think it worked. We didn't, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't do anything. And we said, well, it didn't work, did it? They said, why don't you guys empty your pockets? And we started pulling out sticks and stones and grass and stuff and putting them on the table. And I know we didn't have those going in. And where in the heck did this come from? And he said, well, you remember I told you about the brain has a limited capacity. It cannot believe beyond its, its jurisdiction. It doesn't want to believe anything beyond that. So you travel with your mind and, and it will come back to you. And then all these dots will be filled in as, as your life progresses. You'll remember what you did. It was in retrospect, <clears throat> I did go back now and I do remember going and getting out of the craft. There was three of us. We walked down this ramp. We got out and we went over to a little hillside. I can see it right now. We picked up rocks and sticks, put them in our pockets, and we got back on board. I remember it now, but I didn't remember it then. It sounds like this technology is something that we have to be spiritually advanced enough to be yes. able to use it. And Carr explained that as higher consciousness. He said, you've got to raise the consciousness. When you were operating this disc, did you notice or were you told that anything changed as far as the structure of the craft? There's a consistent expansion and contraction. It's almost, it's almost so instantaneous that it's unnoticeable. And in one of the smaller demonstrations, <clears throat> we had a, a small model uh, aluminum model and I could hear this hum and it was just a beautiful beautiful feeling while this thing was running and I was touching it and then it, it got it got more and more intense and then I found like it was jello and I could put my fingers on it like jello and I I looked at the other guys and then I put my fingers inside this aluminum with my, my hand I said this is impossible when I'm doing this and I put it in in and out of the craft and Carr was over there because he said, yeah, they said, yeah, you're energy, and that's energy. And when you understand that and you, you get a harmonic with energy, you get a balance, you can do anything. There's no limit. So the next day, he had another model, and we put it up, but he was going to accelerate beyond. He says, these <clears throat> retinas are like cameras, are flashing at milliseconds. And when you flash fast enough, things seemingly disappear. So with that in mind, here's our next demonstration. So we fired this one up and we were all watching it and I was, I was getting ready to put my hand in it and whew, the whole thing disappeared right in front of us. He said, it's quite simple. Tesla did this all the time in his laboratory and it's, it's uh, teleported. He said, well, where did it go? And he said, well, it might have landed on somebody's dining room table. I don't know. He says, I don't know yet where it went and I don't know if it'll come back. Maybe it'll show up someday. Maybe it's gone. Maybe it's still there. But we just don't see it. So we don't see it, yeah. And we, it's out of our dimension. And he explained <clears throat> that the mind, when you get, when you tune yourself high enough and you get into the mind space instead of the brain space, instead of logic or instead of reasoning or instead of all those things, you just get up to a sense of knowing. You know who and what you are. That you're a creative, immortal, infinite being. And we all are. And he said, Every, everybody on this planet is, is, are gods by comparison, and they don't know it. They're asleep. <laughs> and until they wake up, this is what our job is. We're making these toys, trying to get them to wake up, to realize there's no limits to what they can do. They don't have to live in servitude. They don't have to live in poverty. They've just been told that by people that uh, unfortunately want to control things. Carr explained to us <clears throat> that the brain that we have operates this water vessel which we live in. But the energy that inhabits the vessel is who and what we are. We are energy, we're not, we're not bodies. 
The energy is all magnetic in nature. It's free in nature. We're swimming in energy. Well, before we could get any further with it, we were uh, invaded, if you will, by um, people with a piece of paper that said they were at this time closing us down. The paper read that we were attempting to overthrow the monetary system of the United States, and that could be construed as high treason, and we were shutting you down and confiscating all your equipment. Wait a minute. Didn't John Hutchison say the same thing about the Canadian government, that they confiscated his entire lab at one time? I stayed in touch with Carr as much as I could, but uh, as soon as I contacted him, I was contacted by somebody. We told you to stay away from even thinking about this. Well, what did the energy companies do to Carr? The uh, powers that be, uh, namely the power companies, weren't quite interested in anything that to do with Tesla or Carr. They didn't want this information out. It was even beyond the energy company. It was behind, it came down to, and it can be traced to this day, back to the international banking system out of England. That's where this all started, the monetary system per se. Because his inventions were so revolutionary, would it upset the whole banking system? <clears throat> yes, it would upset everything. They had a very, very uh, earnest effort put forth to, to eliminate Carr and his, and his inventions and his ideas. Ralph, do you think you're going to build models again? We're doing it now. We have pods related to research facilities all over the United States because I'm getting a lot of help, a lot of support. And there's people like me, people more brilliant than me, that are involved in it. And we're waiting not for the, uh, the crafts because they're, they're waiting in the wings. The crafts are ready now, but we're waiting for the consciousness of the people to raise up high enough and to start accepting these gifts that we want to give to them. Well, hopefully that's changing. And hopefully in time, we'll see people flying around in these crafts Absolutely. of yours. Absolutely. We're going from the uh, Flintstones to the Jetsons. Jetsons. Yeah. Ralph, Absolutely. thanks so much for talking to us today. Well, you're quite welcome. Extraordinary. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, that's just a brief thing. We've had several of these on that have come out on national TV, and people have responded to them. Uh, before this happened, <clears throat> uh, long before it happened, I had gone into seclusion because uh, I got tired of being called an idiot or, uh, you know, crazy or woo-woo or whatever they want to call it. And so I went into deep con seclusion in Las Vegas. I had a wonderful life. I had gated, guarded community and all the amenities that life could offer on a material plane. Uh, I had, uh, I, I, I was worth quite a bit of money. But I was not content because... I wanted to fulfill Tesla and cars and my own dream to see that that transportation and habitation can be in one vehicle, uh, like an RV, if you will, only take it off the ground and put it into the sky. There's not a problem with this. This is, this is rather relatively simple. When you understand the laws guiding levitation, the, the way the clouds will fill with, with moisture right out of the thin air from the invisible to the visible and become heavy laden with hundreds of tons, hundreds of tons of water until the right time and in the right time when designated by the laws of nature will drop that weight. And it, it, the levitation is, is quite simple. We avoid it in our conventional science because we are trying to use conventional ways to, to obtain it, and it's really not necessary. In nature, everything is quite simple. Um, and I'll explain a few things that were, <coughs> were on the tape that may need further explanation. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ralph Ring. This is Marcia Ring, my wife. And uh, we've been together <coughs> as best friends, as partners, and um, teammates, uh, well, we've known each other since the 1980s. At that time, I had, I had gone into to, uh, seclusion and built 
uh, a replica of the 45 foot craft that we had in Apple Valley. This was in Apple Valley, California, which is in the southern part of California, uh, close to uh, San Bernardino, uh, Victorville, down in that area, down from Lake Arrowhead. And um, I <clears throat> wanted to continue my efforts to to see that the information that that was passed down to and through me from from Tesla and from Carr would continue to go on. And we kept getting stopped. Every time I would build something or do something, I had a small laboratory, and they would come in and uh, they'd send the planning and zoning commissions in. They didn't come in in the black suits anymore. That was in the past. But they would come in as planning and zoning inspectors and say, well, you, you have to do this, you have to do that. And it was quite expensive just keeping the lab operating because they, they no matter what we did, it was they caused us to you know continually move and shut down in our activity. They w weren't interested in what we were doing. And then we tried to put it on an experimental basis, trying to get away from. We're not trying to do anything but tinker as a, as as a hobby, building these things for experiments and stuff. But then there was, they, they didn't have a law to cover that, so they invented a law and uh, came in and said, no, you can't do this either. So, <clears throat> um, let's see, I, I, I went to the University of California at uh, Davis and uh, talked to a gentleman there by the name of Moeller, I think Phil Moeller or Dave Moeller, that was, uh, being funded by the government to build spaceships, to build levity disks, to get things off the ground, to be able to levitate them. And uh, I saw what, the, what he was doing. He had <coughs> circular foil craft uh, energized and operated by eight uh, small combustion engines, which were terribly noisy. I had to cover my ears when I, when I listened to it. Very polluting, very noisy, and uh, I think at best they got 12 feet off the ground. That's all they could do. And then they'd expire their, their fuel, which was fossil in nature, and they'd have to come back down. So I watched this a few times, and I was invited to watch it. And uh, his, his ideas were not only flying saucers, but to build flying cars, et, et cetera. So I said, well, I would like to talk to you about your your methods of levitation and, uh, and uh, uh, energy. Uh, we found, and this, this was in the later 50s, uh, I can't remember when it was exactly, we found that you can use magnetics energy much more efficiently. It's, it's free and abundant everywhere. It has no pollution, no, no uh, expiration. You can, magnetic, magnetism goes on forever. We're, all built with magnetism. We have a, a shield around us holding our bodies together with magnetic field. And uh, we want to, uh, <clears throat> I would like to work with you and help you use magnetism for your levitation and, and, uh, and propulsion system. And he said, I'm sorry, but we can't do that. And I asked him why. He says, because I'm on a government grant. The government hired me through the university to keep things like we're trying to get there. And I say, well, you're always going to try with that method because you'll never, you'll never get any more than 12 or 10, 10 feet off the ground. And he said, well, we're paid to keep trying. And if we go, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I, I said, you know, well, I, would, I will give you my card, and, and if in the future you change your mind or anything, he says, well, thank you, thank you very much, but uh, you know, I, I have to continue what I'm doing. I'm very happy with the arrangement. So I left, and I bought some land in southern Arizona, uh, Prescott, Arizona, actually out of town a little ways, we, in a re very remote area, and <clears throat> very remote conditions but decided to go back into uh, designing and, and redesigning the spaceships uh, and, and having a, 
a, a laboratory there. Uh, that's when I met Marsha. That was in 1981 or two or something like that. 81. And um, <clears throat> so I went in underground. I went in on a 40, on a 60 degree angle hill and pulled out the dirt and made a parking lot and then went in and built a, a 45 foot diameter circle. And the way this was built, uh, a, a, a stick was in the ground with a nail on top of it and a long string. And uh, uh, my wife at the time, that's another story, but uh, before Marsha, we were best friends with my wife and I. In fact, Marsha married my wife and I. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Our history goes back a ways. <laughs> yeah, it goes back. But those are other stories, and if you're interested when we have time, I'll tell you them. But she ran me out with a long piece of cord uh, out to the, to the distance, to the radial point, and said, take this string where we're gonna dig this hole, and she gave me a box of bisquick or flour, and said, go around with the string and mark where we're gonna dig this hole. Well, it's on an angle like this, so I was going down hills over rocks and everything, but we got done and we, we had the, the, uh, the idea. And then I said, this is going to be quite a job because we wanted to build it ourselves. We wanted to build it conventionally, be self-sustaining, which we had eventually got to, but we thought this is going to be a heck of a dig. It's going to take quite a while. But I learned from Carr, passed down from Tesla, that externally you don't, you don't have to do much. In fact, the less you do sometimes, the better, because you'll get in your own way. If you use your internal sources, like your mind, like your intuition, if you will, you can be guided by that intuition to do it a simpler way. And if you don't see it right away, if you have patience, it will show up, it will come to you. So anyway, we were, I started to dig this gigantic hole, and a young man in a, in a backhoe happened to be going down the road about a mile away looking for work. He had signs out, I need work, I need work. So I said, well, I want to dig a hole here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, a, I just want to inter interject. When I first met Ralph and his lady Ruth, um, they were actually building the road out there, taking rock by rock. There was no road to their property. So, you know, I, I couldn't imagine these people that are building the road and then building this roundhouse. So it was quite interesting to watch it being built. So, well, we got it built. We got it uh, to the point where we could no longer have the money to complete it, but we got it to a point where it was self-sufficient. We paid no bills for two years. Everything was solarized. We had solar electric, solar hot water, solar everything. Uh, we had our own garden uh, for uh, communication. We went and took a course. At that time it was necessary to take a course in uh, ham radio so we learned Morse code and so forth so that we could talk on our, on, our re on our ham sets all over the world. You could patch in and talk to everybody for nothing. It cost nothing except for the batteries, and then we had NICAD batteries so we could charge them up and everything. We had, uh, <laughs> at that time I had a computer, it was a, a Timex Sinclair computer, <laughs> which consisted of one KB, and it would take me all day to make a stick man go from one end of the screen to the other, I remember <laughs> programming it. And, but we had color television, and we lit up the mountain with our power, we had plenty of power, we didn't have to want for anything. And then for, for water, uh, we checked on the people that wanted to drill uh, wells and they wanted, oh my gosh, four or $5,000 just to, to drill a hole. So I checked with a friend of mine and incidentally for unusual, if you're looking for unusual uh, information to research, I might mention if you look up Rex, R-E-X research, uh, on the internet, you will find endless things that have never been exposed publicly that, you know, they're, they're, they're plans, patents, and all kinds of ideas. Well, 
he became a good friend of mine, and, and uh, we'd known each other for quite a few years, and I asked him about air wells. And so he gave me all this information on air wells, and they use them in, they've used them in Europe and Asia for, for years on different levels. So I said, well, that's fine. Well, I started experimenting, and we managed to pull enough water, enough moisture out of the air by building this small container, and we were building a larger one uh, to sustain us. We didn't need a lot of water, but we managed to get, I think, well, the most we ever got was about two or three gallons a week, but we were conservative on our use of everything, so it, 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 it fit in quite nicely. Anyway, I think I'll end that, that story of that, the underground house there. But I brought that up because um, a lot of things happened there. We started, I, I started to build a laboratory and uh, somehow the planning and zoning had to come out and, and uh, I had ordered the plans from Sweden about a septic system that was recyclable. You never need to to do anything, it would go, the methane gas could be used and, the, and the, the waste could go back into the garden enough purified from the, from the chemicals so that it would uh, be good for the garden. But I went to the planning commission and I said, I want to put in this uh, septic system. And they said, no, you can't do that. You, you, it's, it's, it's not in this country, not in our laws. And I said, well, this is a working system that's much better for the ground, for, for everybody. And uh, they said, no, you have to dig a hole, put a, a septic tank and leach lines and so forth and so on. So I found myself complying with, with what I had to do to keep, to keep my, my house going. <clears throat> and um, I had started to redesign and build the, the, the small uh, models, prototypes. And I was starting to learn about solid state circuitry and digital. And I knew then that the moving parts would become obsolete. We no longer needed to have moving parts. Uh, in a magnetic field, you have a counter-rotating energy going all the time. It gives you the endless amounts of energy consistently. So. <clears throat> As soon as I started, it's, it, it, all of a sudden I found helicopters coming over, photographing the place and everything. And, and I knew that, you know, since Carr, they were continually watching and observing what we were doing. So I put everything back into my intuition and said, okay, what do I do now? And all of a sudden, a friend of mine, uh, his name was Walter Baumgartner. He had a, a magazine called Energy Unlimited. Wasn't that the name of it? Energy so. Unlimited. And they're still available somewhere. I, I think Library of Congress has them. And he was really, his whole life was energy to how to, how to get it out and make it easier for people to live. So he wrote these, these books. But he was constantly harassed about his publications and said, this is wrong, this is impossible, it, it's not conventional, it doesn't fit our laws, etc." But he approached me, came out on the property and said, I, I, I see where you're at, I know where you're at. I, intuitionally, I can, I can feel what you're trying to do and I, I want to let you know I have a place in, in New Mexico, Magdalena, New Mexico, that is quite private and personal and, and there's 100 acres where we can develop these things without being harassed. He says, can we work together? So I said, yes. So. I gave him everything I had, and then I started going back and forth to New Mexico because as soon as I started doing something on, on the land, somebody would show up and just kind of be nosy and so forth. So anyway, it was a constant harassment. It's been for 50 years. People don't want to see the technology that we're using. So anyway, I turned it over to Walter, and he started building them in, in New Mexico. And he got to a point of levitation, and he was getting him a foot or two off the ground. And uh, he, he, he's a conventional electronic genius. He was a physicist and, 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 a, and a genius in electronics. And I said, well, you're going to get to a point where 
the conventional ways will no longer work because you're going to have to use consciousness. And he, what is that? What's consciousness? I, well, it's it's who we are. Everything is consciousness, and it it uh, requires a spirit of of uh, of integrity and 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 focus on what you're doing. You have to love what you're doing enough to where your device will start talking to you in, in a language that's unfamiliar to the conventional science. But as you, you move forward, you will see different aspects that need attention from a compassionate standpoint instead of a, a, an anger or a fear or a doubt. And I so say you'll have to replace those former ways of doing it before you'll get it off the ground because this craft that Carr designed was in essence a, um, uh, here's where I go to the woo woo bin, huh? but, <laughs> but it was a living entity because everything without, without exception has life in it. There is nothing but life everywhere. We say, well, this, this stone, this quartz crystal here, that's just a stone. And in a frame of reference, it is just a stone. But there are other ways of looking at it. Geologists look at it differently. Uh, uh, I look at it differently because it is, in its own way, sustaining its own life form. It's not our life form, so we reject it as us. That's nothing. But in its own way, it has its own life and its own structure. So I told Walter, when, when you, you have to have the spirit of consciousness and love this little craft and it will talk to you and tell you how to build it. Well, he eventually got to a point where they came in and shut him down too. So anyway, it's been going on now for 50 years. Well, um, that brings me to a point of um, I uh, back in Las Vegas, I had retired and set up another another way of life. I had everything I needed and everything. And the story of what I'd done kept dripping out. Purple would call me and ask me about it. And I said, no, nah, nobody's interested in this. Uh, just forget it. They don't, they don't like it. They don't believe it. For one thing, the main thing, they didn't believe any of it. And um, until it got to uh, Kerry Cassidy and Bill Ryan at Project Camelot, and they called me up and said, sir, it's time that you to bring this information out because times are changing and we're, we're, we're digging ourselves into a big hole and we need alternatives. We need these ideas to come out now. And will you speak to us? And at first I told Marcia, no, I'm not going out there again. I get almost tomatoes thrown at me sometimes, you know. So. And what I'm going to say today, it'll probably, you know, <laughs> be different than you've heard before because I'm going to really get into it in a minute or two or in a few minutes. So anyway, um, I said, okay. They said, well, yeah, it's time. And we've talked to, to many other people in the science realms and so forth. They, they have run into to a, the squirrel cage where they keep repeating the same thing over and over, a, a new color of a car, a new radio, a new everything but it's still run by the same engine, a combustion engine. And it goes over and over and over, and it will go on forever unless we change that, unless we do something different. And you guys apparently have done that. So I said, well, yeah, we'd like to see a change too. And they said, well, let's talk about it. Let's come out on the air and let's see what people, let's see your response to it. So before that happened, again, I was stopped. I was, um, I was getting knee replacements, and uh, I had replaced one knee and got back into full recovery and was in the midst of, of uh, the same thing happening with the other knee when I was, again, stopped from my further motion in, in my consciousness and what I was trying to do. Uh, that happened way, when on the, the day before my release from the hot, from, from rehab. rehab, rehabilitation, they said, you're free, you can go home tomorrow, just do your exercises. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I had about 
four or five or six guys around me with, and they were strapping me down and they, they I had all kinds of IVs in me. And uh, I said, well, what's going on? I was going home in the morning, what are you doing? They said, well, we, we're changing your IV or something. And I said, oh, wait a minute, I don't, I, I'm not aware that anything like this was necessary. I want to talk to the doctor. Doctors are not available right now. And I said, well, somebody better be because I don't, I don't want to uh, I don't want to go through this without knowing what's happening. Well, then the next thing I knew, I started getting a little loud, and they brought in a gurney with a couple of guys, and they loaded me on the gurney, loaded me in an ambulance. Now, I was right next door to a hospital. It was, you know, 100 yards away. Put me in the ambulance. I was still strapped down, and they wheeled me 25 miles away and uh, put me in another hospital. And when I got there, they uh, they had a group of doctors, and they said, "Yeah, well, this is you're in a pretty serious state here. You've lost all your white cells, and you're you're dying. You're you know we we don't know what we can do here, but we'll see what we can do." Well, that went on intensively for 11 days in intensive care, and it got worse. I went through 17 different things at the same time. My body swelled up like a well. You were there, Marcia. Maybe you can explain that part while I take a drink of water. Okay. Uh, his wife at the time called and said, "I don't." The doctors say that he's not going to live. So I lived in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and he was in Las Vegas. I took off work and flew to to be with him, and he was double in size. His hands, his his whole body was just puffed up like like a frog. And, um, and they did not give him any hope. I asked Ralph at that time, do you want to live? And he says, not really. I'm not doing what my passion, what I, what I was created to do. I'm not doing that. And I said, but you can do it if you want. But at that time, I thought when he says, I don't want to live, I wasn't sure if he was going to ch be able to change that. And so anyway, I said, you can do both. You can take care of your wife who needed his help at that time. And you can also, go, you can speak, and you can, and you can go on with your work. And he says, do you think I can do that? I said, if you want to. So go ahead. No. <laughs> well, let's see. The, the interview from uh, Camelot was successful video-wise, but they got back to wherever they came from, Hollywood or wherever, and they found out that the sound had been destroyed. There was no sound. So that was at the time I was in the hospital. But they had called for another interview. They wanted another interview. And in the hospital, the doctors coming in said, you know, there's, there's just no way we can save you. You're, you're terminal. I'm sorry, you better call your priest or whatever you do, but you're, you're not going to make it. So, um, and Marsha was there when the, when the doctors were making these statements, and Marsha was there also when I expired. I went through a death experience, and I want to tell you, and, and I, if there's anybody that's experienced going through that, you'll understand. The ones that haven't, it's something to just be aware of, that death is nothing like you think it is. It happens in a microsecond one that you can be conscious of and you can play it out as long as you want but it's not very it's, it's it's very very fast and it's it's a conscious experience i know this is pulling us gradually away from a third dimensional world here and that's where i want to take you today is into a multi-dimensional world filled with frequencies and and vibrations and everything that we all use but are not consciously aware of and we'll get there as, as I'm moving on. I hope I'm on, on the right track here. <laughs> anyway, so I expired. And when I expired, they came in and they covered me over with a sheet. And just suddenly, in, in, in microseconds, I was, I was fully conscious of it. There went my old life. There goes Ralph. Oh, my gosh. 
And then I was there and Marcia said, let's get out of here. And I'm metaphoring right now because I don't remember the details, but in essence she said, let's get out of here. <laughs> so, so that's what happened. And then, and so I knew then I could go on with my passion, which is to see us, and, and, and the spaceships are only a symbol. They, we don't really need them. But we don't really need automobiles either, but we're using them. We use all kinds of forms of, of conventional transportation. But until we get back to the state of who and what we are, we have these ideas, these toys for people, these uh, conventional, non-conventional ways of doing things. So, um, Anyway, uh, life went on, but I knew then I had to rapidly pull myself together, and I was in, I was in perfect health after that. And when I had a resilience, and death no longer had a, any pangs of fear, I knew what death was. It's just, it's not like we think it is. And when we experience it, we create. We we are the, we are the cause. Internally, of what we see and do externally. These are effects out here. They don't, in our reality now, because we're living this reality, they don't really exist, except when we need or want or care for them to exist. And it's with love and compassion, because we are you, and you are us, and we're just mirrors reflecting each other. So it's a beautiful concept that we're living in. We, we have reached the state of consciousness of realizing that everything in frames of reference, now that's an important statement, frames of reference is true. Everything in frames of reference is love. Everything in frames of reference is real. But you have to put those in frames of reference because without frames of reference you go into a belief system, a form of duality, of of, of uh, well, I believe this, and, and, and you get in the science world, you get in the religious world, and your belief system's going to be crushed one day by another belief system that comes in and points out, well, you didn't look at this, oh, I forgot that, and you go back and forth in a squirrel cage world of constantly changing your beliefs. And that the belief system goes right, wrong, up, down, left, right, goes on forever if we want it to. And if we want to enjoy the third dimension forever with that belief system, that's not a problem. <clears throat> uh, my kids are enjoying it now. They're having a wonderful time, but they're having parties every night. They're having fun, you know, <laughs> banging themselves up while landing in the hospital and this and that. But they're having a wonderful time with what they call trauma and drama. And they can't wait for the next trauma or drama to come so they can experience another bump or another bruise. <clears throat> and they don't listen to mom and dad anymore. They, they think we're a couple of kooks. <laughs> so, um, so um, um, where was I? <laughs> you were talking about your death experience and, and oh well, and, that's over. But and it, how you you need to go on with the now project Camelot. Yeah. Oh, so so anyway, because I want to expedite this, because I really want to get into what I've come here to talk to about, and I'll tell you about the spaceship, and I'll tell you how they're built and what they do and everything. But and I'm kind of building a framework so that it'll all fit as you put it together because I can't put it together for you because you have your own way of doing it. But um, um, what was I doing? <laughs> was One thing I want to say, when he came back, when he came out of the death yeah, experience, that's... he has never had a fear of death or fear. It, he, he eliminated that. He came back as, as the same Ralph Ring, but different with different feelings, different knowingnesses. Yeah. And so that's been really a, an amazing. And I found point. out conventionally we try to do away with the idea of fear. And, and, and you're never going to get rid of it. So you might as well make friends with it. And I made friends with fear on an avalanche in northern Washington state when I lost my grip and was sliding down into a, a hole that might have been a thousand feet deep. I was hanging onto the edge of the hole looking over 
and all I had was snow and ice with, with gloves trying to keep my balance. And I could feel fear coming up through my feet, up through my legs, and warning me, advising me not to panic. Because if I panicked, I would let go or whatever, and I, I, would, be, I would have to go into another life form or whatever. <laughs> so, Ralph, Marcia, that's a cliffhanger. Could we take a 10-minute break and oh, come back sure. and hear? Oh, see. Okay. I, this is exciting. So everyone uh, just take a 10-minute break, and we'll see you in a few minutes. It's all yours. Well, as I was saying <laughs> about fear, I was on the side of a, of a hill, um, and um, the avalanche condition that got me down the hill, and I was just about to go down into a, a very deep crevasse when this fear started crawling up my legs, and I got to my gut, and I had a choice. I could panic, and I didn't know where that would get me, but I panicked in the past, and it wasn't comfortable. <laughs> so I decided to stay still and let fear guide me. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And it, suddenly it said, well, this was a stick sticking out of the snow. And I said, grab that stick. I said, that's going to break. It said, grab the stick. So I grabbed the stick, and it was part of a trunk of a tree. It was a root of a tree. So I could get stability and calm down enough to dig my hand in the other side for a rock. I found a rock, and I, I pulled myself out. And then in retrospect, as I sat... Re reviewing or reflecting the, the experience, oh my God, it just saved my life. This is my friend now. So when I need fear, I will call you. And when I don't need you, don't come around. I mean, I just made a deal with fear. It, was, it became my friend. So now, when I get close to something that's dangerous, it comes up and warns me. And I say, thank you, thank you, I'll handle it. And, and, I, and I, it's my friend. So now I never, never have to deal with fear or anxiety controlling me. It's the other way around. I have, I have a friendship, not even control. I have a friendship with fear. But I got a lot to tell you, and um, so I'm going to move on with this. And I'll probably miss a few things, and, and, and there will be a short period of questions and answers if you have anything specifically to, that you'd like to know. Um, so anyway, um, I got out, I'll run through this very briefly, and if in the future you want to know any more, be glad to ask, ask me. But I got out of the service, I didn't know exactly what to do, and I wanted, I, I was raised in the woods, I was raised in a, in a place called Paradise, California, and everything there, I learned from nature, I learned about Oh, I forgot my, my list. I forgot, <laughs> forgot my list. Uh, the bees. I learned, you know, uh, I would be interested in the bees and how they operated. So I, I would observe them. And at first I was, you know, curiously trying to understand them. And they would get excited and nervous. And they would start swarming. And, and I learned eventually. Now, this was over a period of... A few years as I walked back and forth through the woods seven miles round trip to go to school. And during that time, I kept wanting to know not only the birds and the bees and the, and the, uh, the ants and the squirrels and everything, but I wanted to know how and why uh, nature operated the way it did. And so I remember this one day, I said, it's time to sit down with the bees and find out. And... Uh, and, and later on, and I'll tell you a bee experience that I had that I think you'll find interesting. But I sat down and I, I kept getting closer to their, to their um, hive. space, yeah, their, their hive. And I, I heard the intensity of the wings. They would get a little more intense. I thought, oh, they're just like me. They're getting a warning, like, hey, don't come too close. You're, you're getting into our territory here. And just, you know, back off and relax. And, and, and we're going to come and take a look at you. So all these bees would come around, and eventually they would land on me. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get stung. But I stayed calm, and I said, hey, well, what are you guys doing? We're just checking you out, you know, just checking you out. And then they'd leave, 
And then finally they didn't want anything more to do with me and I didn't even have a bee around me then and I'd get on and, and look into something else. But uh, again, and this was before the, the fear incident, but again, if you, go, if you use your intuition instead of your, your, your uh, even your logic and reason will leave you wondering sometimes. But your intuition, if you nurture it and, and become friends with it, it will guide you to uh, always being safe, always being comfortable, and it will, it, it will uh, without worry, without doubt, it will lead you to your next adventure if you allow it to eventually. But, so I was raised in the woods. I came out after, after graduating from grade school, eighth grade, in the woods. I came out into the um, bigger world, the, the world of industry and, and business and, and uh, medicine and, and so forth. And I found all of it almost immediately useless. Like, they, what are you doing? I couldn't believe, you know, they were still doing this and that, which I'd learned is not necessary when you follow the laws of nature. So I said, well, I, okay, I want to do something about this. I want to, you know, make a difference and show people that if we can go back to the laws of nature, you don't have to toil, you don't have to, to, to um, work so hard at doing things that are relatively unnecessary because you have to do them over and over and over again and it's not necessary. So, so I devoted my life then to, and I've always been interested in magnetism since I was a kid, so I said, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll just go along and, and, and let my intuition guide me and I, I saw I didn't want to participate in the conventional ways of doing things because they seemed backwards, they seemed going in the opposite direction of nature. So eventually, and in the interest of time, I'm kind of metaphoring and going forward uh, with, the, with, the, with the talk. Um, eventually, um, I wound up as a laboratory technician, and I wasn't even qualified to be a laboratory technician, but they gave me the job because of my interest in natural law. But they, they hired me on as a laboratory technician in a government-funded research and development laboratory in Costa Mesa, California. And uh, because of my interest in ma and my knowledge of magnetism, they put me on a magnetic uh, experiment that they were working with. And the experiment <coughs> was, I had a giant oscilloscope and a giant um, uh, camera and uh, uh, I had a cathode ray tube, what equi equates to a cath cathode ray tube, firing electrons, like you do on a TV, the old TVs, to the, to the screen. And I, my job was to fire an electron through this magnetic field without deflection. Get an electron through that field, either to the left or to the right, it would always deflect. It would always go into the positive or negative deflection. And they said, don't worry, just keep jacking up the power, keep forcing that little electron. And, I, and that went on for quite a while until I realized this is not natural. They're, they're, they're trying to force this little guy to go where he doesn't want to go. So I, and, and I equated that to my, you know, natural studies. And then on the next bench over there working on, on uh, levitation, and they had a coil, uh, iron core and uh, wires, and they called them ig igliotrons in those days. And they were firing it up, and they would they would levitate a steel ball for for three or four minutes and burn the coil up. And they go get another, and go get another, and go get another, over and over. Four hundred dollars a copy, and this was in 1957 or something, way back. So they were expensive. And supply said, oh, don't worry, just keep using them, it's okay. And my experiment, every day when I shut down, it was caught, they wrote it up to $10,000, $10,000. I said, this is an experiment <clears throat> that's going nowhere, and they're getting money here for, for not going anywhere. I can do a better, better job. 
And so I went home and I worked with my understanding of natural law. I, I went to a garage sale and got an old TV and took the cathode ray out and set up the same experiment with the magnets on the living room floor. And I said, okay, we're gonna go from A to B without deflection. What I learned in nature, and it was inherent then, so I knew what I was doing, is nature breathes. And conventional science and conventional ways of doing things, they get so excited to see a result that they force it. They try to force the result. And when you force nature, she doesn't budge. She's not gonna go where you want her to go. You have to work with the law of nature and let it breathe. So I said, okay, little friend, and when I, I had a, uh, uh, when I fired up the, the uh, gun, the electron gun, um, I pulsed what's called pulsing the signal. I gave it a, an extra microsecond or two so that it could breathe. So when I fired it, instead of trying to force its way through to one full pole or the other, it went into a spiral. It went into a vortexual motion and went through the field without deflection, none at all. Went through, first time, first time it went through and I said, yeah, that's the way to go. <laughs> so so I, I took pictures and wrote up the experiment and I said, oh, I told my wife, I said, we're gonna get a raise, we're gonna have a new this or that, we'll, I'll have a laboratory. <laughs> and. Uh, and so I said, well, I got so cocky, I said, well, I'll take their other experiment, I can do that, acoustical levitation is simple. Um, I saw a movie one time, an eight millimeter, I, I think it's still available on the, on the YouTube, in Tibet, uh, raising these giant blocks up the side of these cliffs. They use these long horns and drums. And I remember well, they'd, they'd get these sound waves and they would take those blocks up the side of the hill and they'd start building with these giant blocks using sound. I thought, okay, no problem. <laughs> so I, I got a 15 inch woofer speaker out of the TV, <laughs> put it on the floor, <laughs> had a little audio amplifier, 25 bucks that I, I bought somewhere and I hooked it up and I started experimenting with the sound waves in, inside of a cone, a parabolic cone. It's like, so <clears throat> I tried everything, the squares and rectangles, and finally I said, oh, duh, what about a round circular sphere? And so I got a ping pong ball, I put it in the center, and right away, as soon as I got it, 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 I got it to the right resonant frequency where it was happy, and it stood there and stayed there, levitating. I went to bed the next morning, I woke up, <clears throat> still there, I took pictures, wrote it up, and I went into the, to uh, Advanced Kinetics, Dr. Weinhardt, he was the head of the, the institute, and I said, hey, I think I want to raise here. I got, I got my magnetic thing going, and I said, I know I'm a lab tech, I'm not an engineer, but let's call in the engineers and see what they can do with this. The same thing with the levitation. I said, no problem. <laughs> well, Dr. Weinhardt, he's a pretty, pretty, uh, keen physicist, he knew what he was doing, and he said, yeah, he says, I, I see what you're doing there, I, I understand that, but Ralph, you don't understand that this is a government-funded research and development laboratory. And <laughs> <laughs> and we're paid to look for answers, not find them. <laughs> So that boggled my mind. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm on a wrong, <clears throat> I must be on the wrong planet. I don't understand this. <laughs> they, they just, they don't, they don't get it. They don't want to get it. So that's when I, when I got to meet Carr. <clears throat> I told my neighbor what had happened and uh, um, they, uh, they, uh, uh, oh, the, Dr. Weinhardt said, go back to work, we're going to put more money in your envelope. Don't say anything to engineers, don't talk about this at all, because this is, this is not to be talked about. 
Well, I went back and I realized, what am I doing? I'm just wasting my time and everything. But I did have a family that I was having to support, so I was a little concerned about my income. But pretty soon, that didn't matter anymore. I realized I had to do, I had to be me, and I had to go back to nature, and so I had to quit. Well, that was... <laughs> So I told my neighbor what had happened, and he said, oh, you, you need to talk to these other guys. There's a bunch of us that once a week we get together, this little group called Understanding, and we just rap and, and uh, um, uh, brainstorm and come together with ideas, and uh, they'd like to hear what you're talking about, because they, they have things that similar interest and similar things happening to them. So I went over. I told him, I said, you know, I want to see <clears throat> us get off the ground. The rubber tire is ruining the garden. It's tearing up beautiful forests and putting down asphalt and cement and rubber tires and noise and pollution. I want to see us get like the, from the Flintstones to the Jetsons. Like, let's get it, get it up in the air. Take, take the tire from this position and put it in this position. Just take it up off the air. So um, they said, well, you sound like a guy we got. He's stuck in Arizona, in uh, Oklahoma. His name is Otis Carr. He's a direct uh, protege of Nikola Tesla. And uh, he's trying to carry on Tesla's work. And he's very, very heavily bombarded by people that don't want to let it happen. And he's constantly under... Uh, scrutiny and surveillance and shutdowns and everything but he wants to build spaceships and uh, it sounds like that's what you you guys are going to come together so they contacted Carr and they invited him and his entourage uh, engineers and physicists and PR people come out to California and meet with me so we they did. We came out to California, and they put us up at Lake Arrowhead. It's in the mountains, and they put us in a big cabin. And I got acquainted with Carr. Well, it was like talking to someone from a multi-dimensional universe. This guy didn't have any limits. I mean, at first he's reaching all the the polite. Excuse me. Too much breakfast. <laughs> uh, and, and, and adequate things to say and do, but then we got into it. I, I said, I want to get into, you know, I want to get in to do this. And he says, yes, I do too. So we would sit out all night and, and, and discuss, you know, that, that what Tesla had taught him and, and he was teaching me and we were working together on the things not available to the public because the public was not interested. And that was about consciousness, about what consciousness is and what it does. Consciousness is everything. And he explained even in those days, he said, we live in a spiritual world, not a physical world. We, 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 we have a cause and effect. We are the cause, which is an internal consciousness that creates an external world, which is called the effect. And outside of the uh, observation of your, your uh, what's called eyes, your retinas and, and uh, cones and, and rods and so forth. <clears throat> They're just cameras reflecting your internal life, which is the real life. Out here is, is, is not the real life. It seems like it and we create it with our thoughts, but our feelings don't always coincide with our thoughts. Our feelings are internal and our thoughts are external. And, and there's no problem with that. They can, they can align themselves to where your feelings and your thoughts are the same and everything is fine. But, but what happens is in haste or uh, anxiety or something, people start forgetting to the alignment. And they, they, get, uh, they get to... Um, they get too accustomed to their own creation, which is, which is the external world. And instead of forgetting 
that we created it ourselves, <clears throat> we think, well, no, it's not my fault, it's everybody, there's people out there. No, that's, that's erroneous. And Carr would, would explain to me, no, it, it's our consciousness is, we are immortal beings. And uh, that's been known forever, Socrates way back. And all the philosophers talk about the immortal self as being our soul of who we really are. Who we think we are is our external projection. We extend ourselves out to think we are something, and that's uh, in some cases called the ego or whatever, but even eventually you have to make friends with your ego because it's good, also a good friend if you don't abuse it. But um, so I said, yeah, well, uh, he says, well, the kind of craft we're going to be building here is, is magnetic in nature, pure magnetism. We don't want anything to do with electromagnetism because that's conventionality. That's, uh, in fact, the, the topic that I was asked to talk on was anti-gravity. And I thought, well, what am I doing talking about anti-gravity? But now that I see it, it is because I want to get people's feelings and thoughts off the ground to get to see who they, who and what we really are. We are really magnificent beings, all of us, every one of us, and we are doing things now that we don't realize we're doing that are simple in nature. We don't have to go to the, the, uh, to the trouble, to the extent of working hard to get something done. It's no longer necessary when you realize who you are. So, can you take it for a minute? I'm like, can you say something, please? <laughs> well, on that, uh, that <clears throat> thought um, on who we are, we simply have forgot. The veil has been pulled down. The, the programming that we've all been programmed for eons, our parents, their parents, we've been under, uh, in, we've been influenced to be less than we are. It's time now, in, in, this, in this breakthrough energy movement, mm -hmm. it's time to take back our power. Mm -hmm. It's time to remember who we really are. And what we are here for is to enjoy this life, is to be that creative being that we were intended to be, and, and rise up out of the servitude. The, the illness and, and the servitude to having to go to work every day, having to, having to earn a living all of the time. I know it's very difficult because Ralph pulled me out of corporate, so I, I know what corporate world is and I know what servitude mm -hmm. is. But once you break through that and you actually know and really know that we were created as free beings, if you take a look at the birds, I always look at the birds or any of the wild animals, they don't have to go to work and, and punch a time clock every day for their, for their sustenance. They are, everything has been created for us. And once we change our beliefs and our, and our thoughts, you will see it happening. And if you take a look at your lives right now and look beyond the servitude, you'll see it happening anyway. The desires, the intentions that everybody's talking about. When you intend something, you will have it come to you if you will be patient. If you will be patient. So, so many times you say, I want it, and I go buy it. I got have it right now. But if you just allow it to come to you, allow your needs so, and, and <laughs> thank you. And 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 the how is quite simple. Marcia and I are experiencing what would equate in labels, and I'm and a lot of these labels are are made up because I don't know any other words to put on them. I don't have an academic education or anything, but we call it a fifth dimensional consciousness that we're living in or experiencing rather than a third dimensional. Because in a third dimensional consciousness, you have a box <clears throat> with five senses. And that's all you, well, that's all we have been trained or taught to operate from, the five senses. Anything outside of that goes into woo-woo or, or un unexplainable or whatever. So Marcia and I have raised our level of consciousness 
to a multidimensional stage. We no longer have the restrictions of five senses. We uh, we we do things now, and, and and we can you can ask us questions about them later because I want to really get into more of what I'm talking about. We do things now that that seem impossible, but they're they're, they're done every day. We we uh, we to put labels on it, and I don't want to limit it, and I don't want you to think that uh, we're we're trying to tell you something that we don't do. We bilocate. We we. Uh, we realize, and, and, and Carr taught me this too, we are energy. We are not physical bodies. We are energy. And when you accept that, that's the truth. The truth is what we have to get back to, is a simple truth. The, the same is, <clears throat> the same truth that there is no past and there is no future. So stop looking there for your answers because they're not, all of us, we're not there because they really, in truth, don't exist until we put a thought on them. As soon as we say, well, I remember when I was a kid, or I'm looking forward to this, then we are the creators of that. It's happening instantaneously. Um, and I'll get into that because that deals with teleportation, which I'll get into in a moment. I've just been told I don't have much time, so I'm trying to hurry. Um, so, what was I? Huh? Teleportation and by location stuff. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, we, we've got into a state of consciousness <clears throat> where we now, and it's simple, because I know the next question is, well, how? How do you do that? Is it's just simply realizing we're already in a perfect world. We're already in a perfect condition. We just forgot it. And by our thinking differently, we create differently. So we look at something, oh, that's not so hot. Okay, it's not so hot. And, and this doesn't deal with just the consciousness of woo-woo. It deals with basic science of, of the subconscious. Once we tell the subconscious what it is, it will say, okay, that's what it is. And that deals with, well, I can't do that. Okay, you can't, then don't even try. Well, I can do it. Okay, then you can do it. <laughs> And it's that simple. We're, we're, we're led by our intuition, which is, is a part of our subconscious. And if we follow those feelings, instead of the external ones of somebody saying, you can't do that, and you accept it, then you're, you're dead. You're, you can, on that subject, you can't do it. But if you say, wait a minute now, wait a minute, I think, no, I know I can do it. And there's a difference between knowing and believing. In the belief system that I brought up earlier, you can led to believe anything in the world, but nobody can really convince me when I am sleepy or hungry or have to use the restroom. Those are knowing. I know. I know I have to go. I know I have to eat. I know I have to sleep. And that's the difference. It's simple. It's so simple we overlook it. But, the, but there's a belief system which if they say, oh, you don't really have to go, well, they th they're wasting their time because I'm going, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, that... The belief system can be changed, and, I, and, the, and the knowing can, doesn't, it doesn't need to be changed. You can change it, but the belief system, many times you can change your beliefs, or somebody else can influence that belief to be changed. The observation or projection of of knowing can be changed, but knowing is the truth, and the truth is stable. And once you find it, it'll never change. No matter which way you want to look at it or how you want to rearrange it, <clears throat> the truth is stable. And that's what we have to get back to. It's a just plain, simple truth that we are immortal beings playing out a role here that's no longer comfortable. We're getting uncomfortable with the conditions of the world and the poverty and the, all the other things that we want to imagine are happening. And simply let go of those ideas and start cultivating. It's a beautiful world. It's a wonderful world. And you, you probably think, well, that's kind of crazy. And it is until you practice it. But Marcia and I have now come to this state of consciousness where Without exception, and I mean, I mean that, without any exception, we feel everything is good. Everything. There is nothing outside of good. Everything is true. 
in frames of reference. Everything is real in frames of reference. If you can change your thought when you think, oh, this is really not good for me, if you can change an, even emotions, even anger, even, you know, if you could just like Ralph talked about fear, if you can change your perception of it and look for that good, and then you'll see it. And maybe maybe you don't want to see it. It doesn't matter. But but if you can, if we can all start changing that um, that aspect of our thinking, then we can see that more of who we really are, more of that reality. And the question immediately goes to: What about wars? What about killing? What about all these these people that are killing each other? Yeah, what about it? It's not happening to you, but it's a lesson. These are lessons consistently thrown in front of you to look at. Don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Or you'll draw yourself into it by fear, by anger, by, by frustration or, or worry. And it, but as long as they're there, you can thank you, thank you, thank you with, with deep reverence that, that thank God that I don't have to go there. Thank God it's not happening to me. And those are lessons that are externally, uh, assumingly happening. We don't really know that they're happening, but we hear they're happening. We see the television, we hear the news, but it's not a reality until we know it. So don't waste your time on, 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 on the illusion because it's just an illusion that's saying, come on, be happy, wake up, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. And it's a warning to us, like fear was to me, of, of where we're going. Um, so um, I want to get back to the spaceship because a lot of people are interested in that. So anyway, Carr and I got together and, and he had his, his engineers and everything. And it wasn't more than a week until the people called from the, the group that we were studying with and said, we have a laboratory, we have the facilities all available. We have a giant warehouse, a laboratory, a tool and die, a machine shop, everything. Go down and go to work. Let's get some spaceships. Okay. So we went down. <laughs> And we started to work, and we started building prototypes. The car brought some, some things with him, so we didn't have to start from scratch. And <clears throat> pretty soon, past the models and past hundreds and hundreds of experiments, we were able to, to synergize with nature. That means harmonize. Uh, and, and the way we did that is what's called resonance. Uh, resonance is a very simple thing, but it's very complicated if you don't understand it. But, once you reach the resonant frequency of anything, anything, you can change it. You can allow changes to take place. Um, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about the bumblebee. I mentioned the bees earlier. When I was in science class, I was on the second floor of the, 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 the classroom, and the teacher was saying bumblebees cannot fly. They, they aerodynamically, you're wasting your time, they can't fly. At that moment, there was a bumblebee outside the window <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> and I said, this is, this is a choice that nature is giving me. You want to continue with this guy or you want to come back out and find out what's going on? <laughs> so so I, I did. I, that, was a, that was the beginning of my end of academic learning. And, and I, went, <laughs> I went back out to nature. And my intuition led me to a guy that happened to write a book called Tomorrow's Energy Need Not Be Fuel. It's in the Library of Congress. His name was Arthur Aho. And he was a part of the entourage with Carr. Him and his brother, Wayne Aho, was our PR man. Wayne Aho was a, an ex-military, uh, he was in intelligence, and uh, he was exposed to many, many things that they told him to be quiet about, that it wasn't meant to be for the public, and he said, bull, it's just, the public's got to know about this, it's their money. So he joined us, and I met his brother, and, he, and I said, what about the bumblebee? And he said, no, you've got to give credit to your teacher. That's all he knows. That's all he knows. And, and so give him credit, honor him, and I will show you how bumblebees operate. And so he, to he told me, he showed me that next to the larynx in their, in their throat, there's a tiny 
hollow cavity. It's just like a straw that's hollow. And when they start beating their wings, they, they go until they reach the resonant frequency of the, and I don't know whether you're familiar with the Schumann frequency, it's the frequency of the earth. Once they reach the Schumann frequency, they have freed this so-called gravitational uh, influence and created their own little, little sphere, a little magnetic bubble. And they levitate and they, they go around in their own, they're free of, of our gravitational field and create their own. And he says, that's it, that's simple, they, they, they do it. And there are some lizards and there are some... some hummingbirds. You know, hummingbirds yeah. that do the same thing. And he says, well, science someday will find it out, but they're a little slow. But, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, we started building these models and, and we got into the prototype and then finally we got, got them off the ground. We had little small ones, 12, 12 inches and so forth. And we were moving them around our area, but it wasn't enough area, so we used the entire valley to try our little prototypes. And uh, they would uh, illuminate, they would ionize, and they would create a corona around the edge of the craft. And people thought they were flying saucers. And so, oh my gosh, they're going to come running down on us and, and shutting us down again. <clears throat> but it was okay. We didn't have any trouble. But we, were, we kept working and working on it. And, and we got to a point where Carr said, well, because we were working on a shoestring. We didn't have any funding. We didn't, the people that wanted to fund us wanted to control us. They said, well, we'll give you so much money, but we want to control what you're doing, how you're doing it, when you're, we said, no thanks. We're operating on natural law and it has to be free. And if it's not free, then it's no good. So we got to a point where we, we had a prototype. We said, it's working. Let's get a hold of a manufacturer. Let's get a hold of somebody that can put these into use, get them going. <clears throat> so our PR man, uh, Wayne Aho, called General Motors and said, come out, we want to talk to you. And uh, he said, okay, and we, we told him a little bit about what we wanted to do. And he brought him and a couple of engineers and a physicist out, and we met in uh, Riverside, a little town close to where we were. And Carr brought a suitcase with one of our craft, one of our little circular foil craft in a suitcase. And we came in and we, we, we sat down and, uh, and uh, we discussed it. There are, <coughs> there are the Amish that still have their horses and they're very happy with their, their lifestyle. And there are people with their Corvettes and their Maseratis or their Lambinis. That's fine. We don't want to disturb that. We don't want to change that. Everybody can be comfortable in the state of existence where they want to stay. But we want to see the combustion engine replaced with magnetic uh, influences and get things off the ground and have homes and cities and countries. It's no problem. I mean, that's what we want to do. That's our intention. That's what we will do eventually. It has to happen. And... Uh, this guy was looking at us with wide eyes and everything. And uh, he said, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? And Carr opened a suitcase. He just opened the lid of the suitcase. And the, he could see the little craft. And we had it um, with lex plastic that you could see through. Lexan plastic. You could see through the, the, the periphery of the craft. And he was sitting there. And we kept talking. Carr explained. Yeah, we just want to, you know, introduce this idea. And it doesn't have to happen overnight. We'd like to introduce it to you and then let your engineers and stuff work it into a program when they can gradually not replace the car, but supplement a different way of transportation. And uh, uh, so they, the, the engineers were ex examining, looking into it, and they said, Where, where's the ignition switch? Where's the steering wheel? You know, there's nothing there. It's just an empty cabin. And Carr said, well, <clears throat> that's where the difference comes in, and, and it's not going to be that easy to explain to you, but we'll try. So Carr started explaining a little bit about consciousness. When you realize you have it, you can do miraculous things. And 
<laughs> so the little craft came out of the suitcase and started moving around the, the desk. And these engineers were coming over looking at it and stuff. And they said, take your coats off, boys. We want to see, you know, if you got a remote. <laughs> they, they thought we had, you know, remote control. I said, go ahead, search. And we have nothing. And they said, well, how's that working? He says, it's simple. It's, it's working because we want it to work. It's a, it's a principle that's not accepted yet in, 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 in the third dimension. Um, or, or it has been forgotten. Not accepted, but forgotten. And he said, well, what does that mean? Well, it's magnetic power, pure magnetism, not electromagnetic. I got five minutes, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so we said we want, we want magnetism because there's no pollution, no maintenance, no, we have no moving parts. This thing can go to the edges of the multiverse and never run out of fuel because everything, everything, the, the glue of everything is magnetism. It holds everything together. These, this glass and these, everything is magnetism. And that's what we want to use for fuel as well as the design and the building of these craft is all magnetism. And he says, you guys are crazy. You guys are nuts. And I said, well, it's the way it is. And you can never have an accident in magnetic power because it, you'll never crash. And weapons are obsolete because you operate these with good feelings, not good intentions. And, and there's, there's no need for weapons. And he said, well, this, this, this is, doesn't fit in the system that we have. We have hundreds of thousands of people working for us all around the world. They have paychecks every week to take care of their family and their children to go to school. And you, you guys are outlawed. You're crazy. You're, you're going to upset the, the apple cart. You know, you can't do this. And Cart said, no, no, we want to get people, give them these devices. The, the center of this is a, it's called a Utron electrical accumulator. <coughs> it's not a generator. It accumulates like the bumblebee, the energy right out of the right out of the the air we breathe, and puts it into this resonator cavity, which consists of like the two ice cream cones, a double tetrahedron, like this, and it gets inside there and starts vibrating, and reaches the resonant frequency of the external uh, axis and the external uh, conditions around it, and accumulates the energy. And you can convert it to, to vibrational energy, electronic energy, any kind of energy you want to use it for. And um, eventually, even electricity won't be as it, as it is now. You won't need it because it won't be dangerous. You can use vibrations to do everything. You can go into a room and illuminate the room with a, something no larger than this. And this is what we're working on now. That's why I've only got five minutes. I'm trying to get it all in here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, where we're at now, see, we, did I finish that sentence? No. No, I didn't finish it. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, if you put them up, we'll shoot them down. Oh, oh yeah. So the guy said, we were, you guys are outlaws, get out of here, we don't even want to talk to you. And, and if you, Mr. Carr, if you put those things up, we'll shoot them down. We don't want you around. You're, you're an outlaw to the system. So Carr says, okay, I guess we shot our best shot. We better go back. We had a 45-foot craft, a larger craft. And he says, it's, it's ready for operation. It's been through some tests. I want you to take with two engineers. And, he, and I'm just a, a lab tech, but I'm, I'm into nature and I'm into natural law. So he, he selected me to go along. And because most of the time I was running for hamburgers or I was working on the machine to, to build parts, so um, he said, I want you to get on board, and we're going to take a test flight. And as soon as we get done with that, we're going to take these. We had two more that were going to be ready. They weren't ready. And we're going to take these craft and go over New uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, all the big cities, and come down where people cannot mistake that there's something there they don't understand. They better ask their representatives, what's this going on that we don't know about? And he says, that's where we're going, boys, so let's go. So, so I got on board with two engineers, and I'm not letting you talk at all. I'm sorry, honey. I, I, okay. I neglect her all the time. It <laughs> stabilizes me. <somehow. laughs> so we got on board, and as you saw in the film, 
we had a, a crystal, a giant crystal in the center of the craft, and it was illuminated with with a form of laser, and I don't I don't know what kind or organ or whatever, but um, in and he said now. What we're going to do is we're going to go down range about 10 miles. And what we, we've had the engineers go down there and they tested that area electronically to vibrate at the frequency equated to in the light and color spectrum as the color of aquamarine. It's just the color. And it's a neutral, it, aquamarine covers from, 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 uh, what is it, emerald to sapphire. It covers a large range of frequencies. But this aquamarine was an area that they measured. And what we're going to do, we're going to fire the crystal and we're going to keep uh, the same thing I did with the, with the little electron, keep changing it until all these colors in this, this was a quartz um, crystal. Like a holographic crystal with all the facets on it. And when it reaches the color of aquamarine, you, you've reached a resonant frequency of 10 miles down there, and I told you before, we're all energy. Nothing exists but energy. We just are thinking in a box. So we're going outside of the box, which is outside of time and space, and we're gonna have this experiment, and you're gonna do something there, and then you're gonna come back, and no problem. So he says, okay, so we got on board, and we got ready, beautiful, colors that lit up the ship. It turned into this beautiful aquamarine color. And I thought, oh, we're getting ready to go. <laughs> and, and, and we waited and we looked at each other and then Carr says, okay, that's it, boys. Come on down for debriefing. It's all over. And we said, well, we didn't go anywhere. And we looked at each other. We didn't do anything. No, we didn't. So we went down and, and Carr I know. Uh, Carr said, how was it, boys? And they said, well, we didn't go anywhere. What, it didn't work or what? And he said, oh, you don't think so? Empty your pockets. I said, what? Empty your pockets. So we started emptying our pockets on his desk, and we had sticks and stones and rocks and everything. We emptied it on his desk. Where did that come from? And we knew we didn't have it when we went in because we had to we had to shower up and put on these little jumpsuits and we, and we knew we didn't have anything. Nobody came inside the craft when we were there. So I said, well, how did that get there? And he said, I told you we were going outside of time and back into time. Your brain, and this is, this is his own definition because you might be many, many ways to define this. He said, your brain is, operates at its optimum capacity of taking care of its jurisdiction, which is your vessel, your water vessel, which you occupy. And it makes sure that all your organs and all your facilities are operating properly. It's not interested in spaceships or, or deep sea diving or, or anything else. It wants to take care of the body. So, okay, well, I'll just round it off. Oh, round it off, okay. So anyway, huh? The ending. You want to hear the ending? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you think? Can we yeah. extend for 15 minutes? No, we, we don't have that time, but we want to hear a wrap up. We're real curious. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> Let's all do it together. Outside of time. This is our spaceship. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> so 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 anyway, um, he said that your your body your brain doesn't doesn't know or want to know anything outside itself. You have to use your mind. Your mind is equated to your intuition, to your heart, and and to the to the ether world, not not the conventional world of, of, of that we're familiar with, but the world of the ethers, and uh, so. You will someday remember it. Your brain will eventually accept the fact that you, that this happened, but maybe not right away. But what we remembered later was we did go down range. I remember going down and picking these things up and putting them in my pockets and and getting back on board. And for years, uh, you know, I had no way to to verify that. I had you know I didn't even barely talk about it. But we got a 
an email, I still have the email from two police, there was a police officer, he was on duty with his buddy, there were two police officers that were on duty that night and they saw us. They, they said, yeah, it came down and, and stopped and just, you didn't put anything down and you got on this ramp and you went down. And I thought, oh, you saw us. Well, great, then we have some verification that something happened. But, um, so then we, we got back and said, okay, successful. The next day or two, we're gonna take this thing over to Los Angeles and put on plenty of lights and activity so that they can see us. <laughs> and uh, so then, it was the next day or day two, day two after that happened, these trucks came in with these troops armed with, gu with guns and everything, these big armed, armored trucks, and these black cars with with all kinds of people with badges hanging on them, FBI, CIA, I don't even know what they were. And this guy came up and wanted to see all of us and they, they kind of corralled us into a, a little group and he addressed Carr, he says, <coughs> we're, we're, we're a, a cease and, and desist. desist, we're calling you to shut down this operation immediately and we're confiscating all your goods and everything. And the car said, wait a minute, wait a minute, on what? We're, we're just free citizens operating as hobbies. We're just building hobbies here. We're not hurting anybody. He said, no, 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 you're attempting to overthrow the monetary system of the United States and could be held in high trees. And, and so we're, we're, we're taking everything. They went in and took all our files. They took all our prototypes. They took the big ship that I was in to Los Alamos, New Mexico, nine feet underground. I learned later they tried to mount weapons on it. In a, mag in a pure magnetic field, weapons are not necessary. They can't work. So uh, anyway, that's, that, to this day, I guess it's still there. And, and, and the future is we got these pods now all over the world. We got them in Australia, we got them in Canada, we got them in Hawaii that are rebuilding these things. The only thing stopping them from happening is the consciousness people accepting it. it. Let us change, let us show you what we got, because we got them waiting in the wings. The wings are the collective consciousness of all of us. We already know this is happening. We just have to allow it to come forward because we need it right now. Is that, that? I, I think with that, we're all conscious enough to support this wonderful couple. And we are so blessed to have you here today. Thank you. And I'd learn like more to about you. Say one more thing. And we have Marsha has, please hold your applause. We have one more thing we need to say here. I, I just wanted to give our website. Oh, yes. <coughs> we it's, need a web. We need help on our web. If anybody, it's a volunteer basis, but our webmaster has had. Has gone on to greater things. Greater things in his life. And we, we're, our website, which is bluestarenterprise.com. Blue Star. Blue Star. Blue Star. Go ahead. Blue Star enterprise one word blue star enterprise dot com uh, and we need we need help we need some to keep and all this is the beacon we don't ask for money we don't want any money we don't need any money because we get our money now from when we need it we've given away a lot of things that were excess baggage and gone back to to intuition when you use it it comes when you need it, and if you don't need it, it won't be there. But if anybody's interested in in the audience or in the a vast audience, uh, we would like you to contact us at Blue Star Info at g at mail dot com. M a l mail. mail. Blue Star Info at mail dot com. We and would appreciate any help. If you're that interested, that Blue Star Info at mail .com. Thank you. And it's just a beacon and the light so that people can come together and meet each other. We have, we have scientists and all, all kinds of people meeting on our website. And we're not asking for any money. We don't, we don't need anything but love to put everything Again, together. that's Blue Star Info, Info. Blue Star Info at mail com and thank you everyone for coming thank you this has just thank been you. one of the best sessions we've ever had <laughs> <laughs>